There is uh, a consultation just beginning on the Community Empowerment Renewal Bill. I know from discussions with the civil servant Alistair McKinley, who is the lead role on that, and I know he wouldn't mind me saying this, that they, for once they haven't decided what needs to be in the bill. This is not one of these situations where the civil servants already know what it is that they want to do. And I think as Lynn has referred to, and has been, I think uh, uh, Ian touched on this as well, there's a kind of ambiguity within the government about what it is that they're trying to do here and what the tools might be required and what might be achievable. And I'm wondering if we, through this process this morning, and thinking, reflecting on the presentations we've heard so far, might be able to help with that. So I would like you at your tables, I know in Scotland we tend to focus a wee bit on the negative. Let, let's try and focus on the positive. What, what could we realistically suggest would be useful to put into a piece of legislation which would make a meaningful change to community and permanent renewal? Let's have a few specific suggestions on that. If, however, there are, and we've talked, particularly Lynn has talked, about links over to other policy areas on tax, on benefit, on employment, on health, on education. If there are other changes that need to take place in other pieces of legislation, let's note them as a sidebar, okay, and keep the main focus on what should be in a community and permanent renewal bill. And let's try and do that for half an hour, half an hour, and then we'll get back together and find out what great ideas have come forward. Thank you. This table here, your one key point for uh, legislation to enhance community and permanent renewal or similar. Eddie, is it you? Um, uh, well, we, we focused uh, very, uh, obviously, specifically, as Andy, Andy directed us to do, um, on, the, on the legislation. Um, and, and what legislation does is largely place duties on people or uh, usually local authorities and, and, and Scottish ministers. So I think the kind of key point that came out of here was that there need to be some kind of duty on public bodies um, uh, to, to, to recognise what is community-led and what is uh, and, and, and what are what are community community assets, um, and uh, and also we felt that on the other side of things that um, duties on um, Scottish ministers uh, in relation to community assets would um, uh, allow a, 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 a cross governmental look at what this means because often government work in silos in terms of their funding it would give it a, a it would at least give community assets a higher a higher priority. And, 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 and allow a, 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 a bigger debate. Andy, just while you've got that, um, just clarifying, recognising what community assets are. Uh -huh. um, uh, or what, what did we say? Um, somebody help me out here. Uh, we, no, it, it was about, it, uh, yeah, it was about, it, it, it was about our public bodies uh, having a duty. Uh, oh. Yeah, it was, it was a duty on public bodies um, to look at what community assets actually are. Is that right? Am I getting that right? Good. So first of all, public bodies to, to make some kind of assessment of what community assets actually are, uh -huh. and then a, a responsibility on ministers to think about that in a cross-country yes. policy right. way. Yep. Good. Okay, thank you. Two duties there. That's excellent. We've got through with Robin Mike. We have. Second table over here. If you can fight your way through there, that would be great. Hi there. Uh, we talked um, uh, very simply uh, in terms of the legislation and, and what needs to be in there. Uh, we, we said that, that, that it was coming through time and time again is, is the need for um, some sort of community development support. The need to support um, communities in terms of taking over an asset and, and supporting the communities when, when they have control of an asset as well because I don't know if it's down to human nature or whatever but, but there's, a, there's a tendency for groups to become very exclusive yeah. Um, and, and, and what's actually needed is that support to give them the skills and confidence so that they can actually engage with the wider community and evidence that engagement, you know, and, and, and keep that going on, on the long term. Good, that's really helpful. Did you have any thinking at all about what that community development support, what kind of form that would have? Uh, very physical, uh, actual workers on the ground, you know, whether that's coming from um, you know, th things like healthy living centres or whether that's coming from national agencies or whether that's coming from the local authorities, actual bodies, people on the ground to, who are skilled workers. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. Next table. Hi, um, oh, that's one. 
Um, we came at the right at the end yet, and it has to be sort of written into the bill how it will contribute to closing the inequality gap, a bit like the um, Child Poverty Act or the right. Child Poverty Targets. That's very good. Okay, specifically, how it will contribute to doing that? To that closing the, the danger that, that gets forgotten. Right. Okay. So the focus is on closing the inequality gap, and you give yeah. a reference there to the Child Poverty Targets uh, yeah. set up by Tony Blair and and so yeah. on. That yeah. good. Okay. Next table, just a wee sideline to that. I remember, when was it? It must have been 2007, I think they, they, they said that uh, we required four billion pounds to get the child poverty targets back on track. And I remember thinking, I thought, four billion, wow, that, that's quite a lot of money. <laughs> it was only years after that that we were given 500 billion to the banks. So it didn't seem so, so much money then. Okay, back table. Hi. Thank Hi. You. Um, we spoke about many issues, as I'm sure you all did, but we decided to focus on, in terms of the legislation, what you would legislate for. There's some of the successful pilots that have been done around participatory budgeting, and perhaps there could be a case made within the legislation to top slice some of the kind of local uh, public service budgets in order right. to devote to community-led approaches so that that can be stimulated, so that infrastructures can be built around communities and to make sure that there's a truly bottom-up approach to that, you need to put the money where that should be. So to top slice the budgets would be a potential way of, of kind of focusing attention on community-led approaches. How interesting, very good. I remember being at a conference uh, in the run-up to 2007 election and Wendy Alexander actually uh, explicitly supported such a proposal, which I thought was interesting. Next table up here. Um, okay, um, lots, of, lots of similar issues, I think, to uh, what people have already mentioned. Um, we talked about the need to be clear on uh, what assets are up for transferring, what are the things that we want to be publicly owned and publicly controlled, and what are the things that we think uh, uh, that it's acceptable can be transferred. Uh, we also had a, an interesting discussion about um, what happens if there is failure you know, if, trans if assets are transferred, if communities are running whatever would have been seen as services and as failure, because we need to remember, look, we, we had a little bit of a discussion about the, our, our notion of entrepreneurship. Uh -huh. um, and we need to remember that where these assets are being transferred, or certainly the ones that we're interested in today, um, it's, it's transferring in communities that have very low levels of resources. Um, where there's not a lot of money about, and, and that doesn't really lend itself to, or, or may not lend itself um, to a successful um, provision of services if it's, if it's uh, relying on making money. Um, so we need to be careful about um, when services are transferred or when um, assets are transferred that we're not in danger of perpetrating existing patterns of, of inequality. Um, and we need to be able to ensure that that all communities, whether they're disadvantaged or not, are able to rely on um, certain standards of, of uh, service in communities. Good. Um, and one useful suggestion, just to, to finish on, was perhaps it would be useful to look at where this agenda has um, been in place for a longer time and to look at the, the longer term impact of transferring uh, resources to communities and seeing whether it has had an impact on levels of, of poverty and inequality. I think, that's it's not for me, um, I think um, some of this agenda comes from the states and it would be good to look at where there have been uh, significant transfers of assets. Has it actually had a, an impact? Okay, thank you, Peter. So that we're beginning to get some connections here in that specification of what's up for transfer with the, the first groups. Uh, duty to recognise what community assets actually are and what they aren't. And then there's a bit of an echo there with the second group on guarding against the emergence of cliques in communities and guarding against that failure. And uh, a new call for, uh, before we get into this legislation, looking at practice elsewhere. This table here, second at the back. Sarah. Yeah, a lot of um, uh, echoes from the other, uh, the other tables as well. Um, this group think, uh, thinks there's a, there's a real need for um, 
concentration on money that you, that there's a real concern that local authorities are just going to hand over assets and to communities and just tell them to get on with it and walk away. Um, and we think there's a, a, a real need to ensure that if you are handing over assets, there's a, there's a support and the money to go to go with it. Yeah. Um, there was also talk around having communities having more control over um, not only assets but the, the the money that goes with that as well. But in order for that to happen, there needs to be um, a passing over of trust from local authorities for communities to be able to do that. And in order for that to happen, there needs to be accountability of the community group. Big discussion around what is community, are mm -hmm. they representative uh, or not, particularly around um, in a lot of communities, a lot of the groups that exist don't necessarily come from, or people who are, who are living in poverty don't necessarily have the capacity all the time to be able to be involved in that. So how do we make sure that they're represented by the community groups that are taking over the, those assets and that there isn't going to be any resentment of um, particular groups taking hold of a, uh, taking management of a, a building and other groups not being able to, right. um, to access that as well. Um, so yeah, real um, concern around resentment and tension um, perhaps within communities. Communities are not this warm, fuzzy no. thing that all agree, but there's, you know, there is tension within them. Um, and lastly, um, where communities, there's a concern around where communities don't exist, where the groups are not strong enough. So therefore, is there a, a need for preparatory work of creating communities within particular different um, areas, geographical areas? Okay, preparation and support, certainly. Did you have a specific proposal on how to uh, encapsulate that trust, accountability and representation issue within a piece of legislation? Um, <laughs> Answers in the back of your postcard. No. <laughs> I'm going to be honest and say no. There was actually there was a lot of confusion, I think, okay. um, around this whole agenda, so no. <laughs> Continuing debate on that. Okay, that's fair enough. Right. This table here, second last table, Andrew. Yeah, um, the, the, the bill itself does present a lot of issues because um, we, we have things that we wanted to be considered in the bill, but it was hard to think about how they could be practically, uh, practical suggestions for the bill yep. to, to, to address these, such as related to the idea about um, some communities needing extra support. Some of the most disadvantaged communities are also the most transient, and so who's going to take on assets um, when, when people are moving around? Yep. Um, and then... Uh, the whole idea of a bill, is it, it, is it a top-down approach in itself that was raised? Um, and there, w there was a lot of concern about expertise and um, signposting to funding and, and kind of support with legal things when it comes to owning assets. Um, it wasn't clear how that could be implemented into a bill, mm -hmm. um, but it's something to be, to be considered. Uh, and then... <laughs> The idea of social assets as well, I mean, how, where does that fit in with the bill? And we're wondering whether the bill was geared up towards material assets and how that can be addressed. And lastly, um, th there was the, the point made that um, you, you, you can have certain circ circumstances where if a, 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 a community centre, for instance, isn't going to be provided by local authorities, then perhaps the best solution is for the community to own it, but then there is the question on top of that um, about, you know, it's a public, a public asset that perhaps shouldn't be um, handed over to, to a group in the community. Yeah. Okay, good, thank you for that. I remember having a discussion at the surf board one time, the community representative on the surf board uh, was going slightly confused. I, I thought we owned these assets already. I thought that was the idea. I thought, thought we all, as, as residents, we already owned these assets. OK, last table here. Um, again, lots of uh, echoes of previous uh, tables. Um, we also talked to some extent about the need for a duty on local authorities to um, provide staffing, community development staff, but then we widened that out and talked about the need for um, an understanding of community-led development to be something which is taken up across all sectors, both within local authorities, NHS, but also the third sector as well, so something about that becoming a broader agenda for everybody and sort of rolling out some of the things that are in Christie. Mm -hmm. um, the other key thing that we talked about quite a lot in terms of what we would like to see in the bill was um, related to something I think Sarah's table were discussing in some detail, which was the need to link in the, um, something around uh, local accountability in the bill. 
so that we don't have a situation where single interest groups, for example, take over the delivery of services, and then you have a situation where, okay, you might not feel terribly well represented at the moment, but at least you can complain to your local councillor and say, we're fed up with the way you're running this service. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just not going to vote for you next time. If that then just disappears to a third sector organisation which yeah. has a particular interest, how do you make your uh, you know, views known as, as somebody who lives in a local community? How do you vote them out? How do you get rid of them if you feel that they've been a complete failure? So there's a broader discussion about the need to link in this whole discussion about assets to the need to begin to really think about regenerating not just our assets and our communities but local democracy as well. Good, okay. So a community empowerment bill might address local democracy and the structure of that overall as well as just assets. Great. Okay, well there's a huge range of points in there it seems to me. I, I think there are two broad, well, maybe more than two <coughs> broad things. One is about definition in the first place. What is it we're talking about here in terms of assets? And just to, again to echo what I was saying at the start of the presentation, my understanding is I think it is on one hand about physical assets, about land and property, but also mixed in there the Christie Commission stuff about uh, co-production and services. The other one is about resources, about ensuring that resources are, are not just put in to in, uh, initiate things, but to ensure ongoing support as communities are transient and changing as they are, and to ensure against the collapse and to cliques, which kind of takes up that kind of point towards the end about who are these people that assets should be transferred to anyway. But a broader kind of ambiguity, it seems, there amongst this audience, uh, the, the, you as participants, about what it is we're talking about in terms of assets and what the implications of that might mean and how that could possibly be uh, encapsulated successfully within a piece of legislation. Okay, so I'm just going uh, to, that, that, I think that has been useful. Uh, I'm, I know that Lynn's got a number of points there to make, so I'm just going to see if we can cut to the chase and get some comments back from you, first of all, Lynn. Thank you very much. I suppose the first question for me would be what is the bill for? And therefore, like the, the, te the, the inequalities table, to ask for some specific measures of success related to fairness. And part of that needs to be the point that you made about how does the bill relate to local democratic traditions and the need to revive those. So that would be the first thing. The second, I think, is more about generating more resources as well as the distribution of them. And that means that the sidebar would include stuff around land tax, around minimum income, because if we're going to have a balance between unpaid, you know, material assets and social assets, we need to look very clearly um, at issues around the living wage and the idea of a minimum income employment. So that would be a kind of sidebar about the kind of economic model that the renewal bill is going to contribute to. And then the third is that at the moment it's set up like this is a discussion between public services, local authorities and the community, but surely a key contribution of the bill will be to get a better balance between the voice of communities and the voice of big business. So let's not forget that big business are a very powerful voice and how will the bill contribute to equalizing the voice of communities and the voice of big business. Good. So those would be the three things I'd like to ask. Lovely, well concisely made too. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, can I pick up the point first of all about the degree to which our presentations were compatible or contradictory because I, I think they are actually uh, compatible. Um, and if, if I didn't make it clear, I really want to stress that I'm not suggesting that community regeneration is the answer to poverty. I think that at best it can have a marginal impact on poverty. And if I gave that impression or give the opposite impression, I apologise for that. Um, I, I do think that poverty will only be resolved by sort of structural change that one's talking about, and, and therefore the question is how we do that, and particularly in the absence of any political party that I can see advocating the kind of changes that are going to actually address poverty. So for me, it's about what we can do within community-led regeneration, and I think the bill sits fairly, fairly within that. Again, as much as I'd like it, I don't think the bill will address inequalities or, um, or, or address poverty. I could be wrong, but I don't think it will. I think, as Andy said, it's much more uh, a kind of element of, of community-led regeneration. I would also reiterate the point I made that I don't think the community ownership of assets is for every organisation and it's for every asset. Lots of assets are liabilities. We're dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of the surplus assets that public sector have are, are liabilities. 
What we're talking about was a particular type of community organisation at the focal point of community-led regeneration. And I think they do, the way they operate, does address some of these issues of accountability. There is built-in democratic accountability. Um, so I think the bill, if it's looking at who it transfers assets to, does need to think about, as well as rights to communities, what responsibilities it places on communities as well. I think the final point I would make is if we're thinking about assets and public sector assets and there's a, obviously ambivalence about communities taking on assets or whatever, we need to think about how assets are dealt with at the moment. The private sector consistently get assets from the local authorities and other public sector bodies at, at either peppercorn rents or knockdown prices. I was reading in the paper yesterday about um, the uh, Waverley um, well, the Wavell Exhibition Centre in Edinburgh, prime, probably one of the prime bits of land in Edinburgh, being transferred to the Murray Group for £40. Pound. Now, I didn't see folks saying, well, what will happen if that fails and what will do this and what... I mean, I think what we're looking for here is some kind of level playing field so that if public bodies are looking to dispose of assets, communities are getting treated seriously and not, not regarded as some kind of Mickey Mouse operators, but if they've got a business plan and a proposition that they're treated seriously and at the very least on an equal playing field with what's already going on, I think, in terms of assets. I suppose the final thing is we get a lot of local authorities saying, well, why would we want to sell the, the, the family silver? And, you know, people have this kind of view that assets are kind of collectively owned in the public sector. And I think it's about horses for courses. I think that communities with that democratic accountability built in, can control assets in a much more creative and effective way that benefits the local community to a greater extent. So I think it's worth thinking about. It's not the answer to everything, but I think it's, a, it's a, something we've got in our armory to begin to look at actually some sort of seriously led, uh, community-led regeneration taking place. Ian, that's great, thank you. And, and that, the, I think the point on the transfer of assets to the private sector from local authorities is a really interesting one. And actually, the day, the day that I had a discussion with Alistair McKinley, who's drawn up this bill, was the day after we gave Northern Rock to Richard Branson. And we gave Northern Rock to Richard Branson at £750 million less than they knew it was worth. A fantastic, I, can't, I think we all individually paid about 350 quid towards that deal. And that's a transfer of community-owned assets to the private sector. So a point well made there, Ian. Nicola, any points from you? Just to say I've enjoyed this morning. And to conclude on reflection after uh, speaking around the tables and hearing other presentations that I would agree with um, what Lynn and um, Ian have both said, but also thinking about the Walkerburn situation, that I'm so pleased I didn't get the land first. I'm delighted that we had that infrastructure established and that we were able to work with that to develop the piece of land. And that's um, really how I'd like to. Good, OK. So really a good point there from Nicola about, about not getting the, the onerous asset, first of all, but building the infrastructure from the start. Good, OK. We're just about on time and I don't want to go over time. So are there any, are there any points that anybody thinks we've really kind of missed out here in the, in the process and format? Point at the back there. Why is it always the furthest away point? I don't understand. There's some kind of law going on here. No, no, no. We, apparently, we need it for the recording. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it was maybe picking up something Ian mentioned in his presentation about um, in the Western Hills that 55% uh, of the land now is, is, is in community ownership. Part of the reason for that is because we've got a, we've got a two-tier system of land reform, really, in Scotland. Uh -huh where communities and crofting communities have got the right to, 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 to buy right. that, that folk in, in other places don't have. And you had the presentation in Neilston yep. up there, and I know they had a real hassle to get a hold, of, a hold of that building. So maybe that's something that the bill should be addressing. The same community right to buy that folk have in the crofting communities should be extended to other places across Scotland. Very good point. You want to make a comment on that? As well as the new bill, um, there's also a commitment to review the land, uh, land reform legislation, particularly how the community right to buy operates. Um, I suspect that will be more a sort of tidying up and trying to make it a bit sim more simpler to use. But certainly we are arguing that that is an opportunity to actually look at extending the community right to buy to all Scottish communities. Very good. And I, and I remember when this, I remember David Miliband when he was still in running for the, the leadership of the Labour Party, or maybe he still is, of course, but I mean, <laughs> at, at, at the time, uh, when was that, about four years ago, when this land use bill was going through, and he was saying, well, that would be really good. And he was talking about applying that in urban areas in England, 
which was a discussion which was not taking place in Scotland and still hasn't been followed through. Stuart, last point, and I'm going to move on to finish. Yeah, I was just, I was just uh, thinking of something I heard earlier on in the week, actually, that um, we've been talking today about transferring assets to communities as, almost as a sort of one-way process. And the, the thing I heard earlier on in the week was um, about the other direction. The example was snow clearing in the borders. No, it wasn't. It was done through St. Galloway. And the example was that um, farmers in the borders could clear all the snow in the borders sorry, it's done for some gallery using their tractors and all that sort of stuff. But what actually happens is the contract goes to a big multinational company, which was able to, do, uh, through procurement, procurement process, was able to um, provide the offer that the, the council had to accept. And I think there's something about, you know, can we empower communities the other way by, by building in something that makes sure that council and others procure their services, um, at least on an equal basis with those from multinational businesses or others. That's, this has been really good. That's another really good point. And people, some people may know that there is actually a con consultation process going on at the moment on a procurement bill in the for the Scottish Government and that, that kind of discussion taking place. So uh, you would like to think that all of these things are somehow seamlessly connected up, which I'm sure they are at some level well above my head. Okay, so I'd now like just to hand to Peter. Makes a, we're just about there, Peter, so uh, it's been your show. I hope it's been useful. It's certainly been a very stimulating discussion for me. I think the key speakers have been great, uh, Nicola, uh, Ian and Lynn. So maybe I'd just like to ask you to do a wee bit of summary for us there, Peter. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andy. I should say, of course, that I wasn't expecting to summarise, so thanks for that, Andy. That's uh, always a pleasure. Particularly, particularly difficult to summarise uh, a discussion that's been so wide-ranging, but I think what this has, has reinforced for me is the importance of this debate um, and just the, the links that were being made uh, towards the end there around the Sustainable Procurement Bill, um, the, the issues that, that Lynn was raising around uh, living wages, the points that were coming across about the revitalization of, of local democracy. These are all essential elements in tackling poverty and, and none of them um, can be looked at in isolation, I think. Um, so I, I, I guess just in, uh, in summing up, where do we go next with this? Is clearly um, a lot of interest in this issue. We were quite overwhelmed by the, the response, both ourselves and SEDC, to, um, to the, the speed with which this, this event filled up. And I think we could probably run it again with a whole group of other people um, somewhere else in the country that's maybe a wee bit more accessible. And I think, so there is, there's obviously a desire to engage with this agenda. And I think there's a desire to make sure that um, when we're talking about community assets, when we're talking about community empowerment, that it is actually having an impact on, on issues of poverty and inequality. And simply because we keep being told that uh, resources are declining, that there's less and less money around, doesn't mean that we need to ensure we need to make that argument that those resources that are available are targeted, are used most effectively to address problems of poverty because they are going to increase significantly over the next few years and we need to be uh, clear about that. So any discussions that we have um, around um, the, the Community Empowerment and Renewal Bill, um, sustainable procurement, whatever the, the issue, we want to try and make sure, and as a, as a network, as an organisation, we'll be making sure that, that poverty and inequality does feature um, and is taken in, into account by policymakers in the, in the drafting of, of that legislation. Um, and I think, I think, again, those issues that, that came up towards the end about um, recognising where assets are already being transferred, but being transferred um, to the private sector, and that that's a process that's been going on um, for a very long time, not just uh, one that's coming out of austerity, but one that's um, been part and parcel of the way that we've uh, been treating uh, assets in this country for at least the last 30 years. So we need to ensure that, again, uh, we, are, uh, we are realistic about what's going on and that we're able to talk about um, these issues as they actually are, rather than um, focusing only on the, the problems in, in disadvantaged communities. So the next stages for us, we will respond uh, to the consultation. We'll be encouraging our members and all of those who are supporters to uh, respond to the consultation. We'll be producing a report from this event and we'll be discussing with uh, the uh, Scottish Community Development Centre about what kind of action we can perhaps take together 
to follow up some of the uh, the discussions that have taken place today. Um, this event has been filmed and we'll put that up on our website. We want as much discussion about this issue as possible. Um, and I guess the final thing is just to say thank you to all of our speakers, to uh, Andy for chairing and bringing us in on time, which is remarkable. Um, for, for all of our speakers, for all of you for attending, um, I'd like to thank uh, Fiona at SCDC and all the staff at SCDC for, uh, for their support in pulling this event together. And as usual, anyone who's been to any event where they've seen me close it before, I always say not only is there an evaluation form in your pack, there is also a membership form for the Poverty Alliance. One of the ways that we keep this issue of poverty higher up the, the agenda is to encourage more of you to be part of uh, the Anti-Poverty Network in Scotland. So I would encourage you, if you can, um, uh, to join us and hopefully we'll see you again uh, at, at a future event. Thanks very much.